A jet fighter might be a long way from a load-lugging estate car, but this particular one can just about claim to be related, because it can trace its ancestry back to a time when Saab decided to use up their spare staff by turning them from making aircraft to building cars. And as a result, their cars have always boasted the highest levels of engineering, as well as being slightly, well, quirky in a Swedish way. Then there's the second of our Swedish offerings, the Volvo. It can trace its ancestry back to, well, an old wardrobe, probably from the looks of most old Volvos. But they have built a very well-deserved reputation for constructing the most durable, long-lived and practical of estate cars on the market. Cars that have, over the generations, carried families on holiday, antique traders and travelling salesmen. And like the Saab, they seem to go on forever and ever. In some cases, the only way to age an old Volvo or a Saab is to cut a slice off the exhaust pipe and count the rings. The Saab has been on sale for about a year now. The Volvo went on sale only recently. And the difficulty for fans of Swedish cars is going to be in choosing between the two of them because they are very much pitched head to head in the marketplace. It's a case, if you like, of how do you like your Swede, sir? The first thing to hit you when you get into the Saab is just how comfortable these seats are. You really do get the impression that this aircraft is club class. Thank you very much. And that impression is bolstered by the presence of this little card that we find in the car, giving us details of the car's safety. But I keep expecting to face backwards and uh, address my passengers for where the exits are in case of emergency. Or is that just me? Good news too when it comes to the amount of kit, because they certainly don't let you down. There's more than enough luxury touches in here. The climate control is particularly easy to use and very effective. And there are some nice little touches as well, like this cup holder. Wow! Somebody's put some real thought into that. It's not just a throwaway item. For my money, certainly it's the most stylish of the two interiors and typically Saab with the instruments banked in front of you. You feel very much like you're in control of an aircraft. And one other typical Saab feature as well, the ignition key mounted down here on the transmission tunnel. They've always done it and it looks like they always will. It does mean you can lock the gearbox as well. Oh, hello. Do I hear the sound that could mean the captain's put the seatbelt warning lights on? Must be getting ready for takeoff. The Saab actually has the smaller engine of the two. It's just 2.3 litres and only four cylindered, compared to Volvo's five cylinders and 2.4. But the Saab is actually more powerful. It has an extra 30 bhp and it does feel faster than the Volvo. There's barely any turbo lag in here. And that's not surprising, really, because Saab have been fiddling around with turbos since the 70s, so you'd expect them to get it right. In fact, the only interruption in the acceleration comes from waiting for kickdown on the automatic gearbox. The best way to enjoy your 9.5 estate is to sit back, calm and unruffled. Think club class again on a long intercontinental flight. Just reserve that acceleration for takeoff and maybe a bit of overtaking. But be warned, when you do come to land, you might find the brakes are a bit of a surprise. It's not that they're not there, they are. But you will have to give the pedal a bit of a prod. There's good news in store for rear seat passengers in the Saab, because there's loads of room and it's really comfortable as well. And then the boot space. Well, it's every bit as cavernous as you would demand in any estate car in this class. But there's more to it than that, because we get this extremely nifty hard luggage cover and then this very clever system of nets and these movable anchor points to which you could tie up ships if you really felt the need to. All well and good, but surely, if it's practicality and space you want, it's got to be a Volvo. It's been that way for hundreds of years. Well, yes and no. For a start, this luggage cover... <laughs> Forget it. Horrible thing. There are anchor points, but they're only in the corners. There aren't a whole rack of them like in the Saab. There is a nice little space here. Good news for smugglers, as long as customs are particularly gullible. And that's about it. In the back, well, plenty of space for your, your passengers here. And again, it's nice and comfortable, but there could be a bit of a disappointment in store here compared to the 9.5. Everything's in here, it's just not as engaging or as special feeling as in the Saab. Now, I'm actually quite a fan of these simple, solid slabs of controls that Volvo seem to be turning out, but I know plenty of people find it, well, rather Euro-bland. They have been to the same school of cup holder manufacture, though. Look at this beauty. Yeah! It's the kind of thing that would finally make you talk in a torture chamber. 
whatever you say. So despite those extra cubes, the Volvo loses out on power, and it does feel quite a lot slower than the Saab. It's another light pressure turbo, and this time there is turbo lag. In fact, that seems to be the only effect of it. The turbo basically flattens the bottom end and brings no particular benefits. So it loses out in terms of power. It loses out as well when it comes to the seating position for the driver and the passenger. The seats feel flabby. They're nowhere near as firmly padded and ergonomically shaped as those of the Saab. So more points down there. Then all of a sudden, the Volvo starts to claw back points, and it does it in a most un-Volvo-like way because chuck this big barge through a series of corners and you'll be amazed. It goes round them really well, really fast. It feels glued down. The chassis is extremely well sorted for a car of this size. To chuck an estate car through a series of bends, this has got to be the one. When it comes time to draw things to a halt, though, be warned again. Unlike the Saab, when you have to give the brakes a hefty prod, do the same in this and you'll be pulling your eyeballs back out of the air vents. It stops immediately. If anything, they are far too fierce. It's very difficult to be sensitive. Great news in an emergency. Bad when you pull up 30 feet short of a junction. So, rather than being just a straightforward battle between two very similar cars, it's become apparent that each of these is going to appeal to really a very different buyer. In essence, then, it boils down to this. If you need an estate car capable of hustling along your favourite stretch of B-road with the biggest payload on board, then the Volvo is your thing. But if you want a cross-continental tourer with a wonderful burst of acceleration and that cosseting ride, it's got to be the 9.5. It wins as well in terms of build quality and arguably style. So that's it. The Saab emerges top speed. Just. <laughs>